So welcome everybody. Um, yes, we, I can see we are recording. So welcome everybody to this latest iteration, this latest incarnation of our um, webinar series supporting the innovation strand of Made Smarter. So it's the 11th webinar now. We're nearing the end of this series, but um, already planning the next series. Um, so this is a topic today that we'll be focusing on that is close to my heart, uh, that enables increased value to be delivered to the customer. So servitization, a business model that is enabled by digital technologies. So we've got a fantastic panel of speakers um, who I'll be introducing shortly. Uh, but first, the, uh, the standard preamble from myself. Um, apologies to those who've heard the preamble before. But uh, yeah, very conscious we've got some, we always have some new um, new attendees. So good to have so many of you with us today. Anita, next slide, please. So who are KTN? We exist to connect innovators with new partners and new opportunities beyond their existing thinking. So yeah, two, we've got 200 staff across the country um, with our specialist sector or technology areas, and we make surprising connections that, uh, that drive innovation. So yeah, whether you're a manufacturer today or a technology developer, tech, tech provider, um, yeah, we can, we can forge hopefully interesting connections and introduce you to new knowledge through this kind of activity that we're doing today. Next slide, Anita. Thank you. So, yeah, we do have uh, deep expertise across um, all the technologies uh, that are described in the Made Smarter review and indeed specialist teams in sector areas. So we bring all these, these different sectors, technologies, disciplines and indeed regions together to drive innovation for the benefit of the UK. Um, next slide, Anita. So this series is in support of uh, the Made Smarter Innovation Network. So this is a um, four and a half year program, um, but innovation networks generally, these are focused activities that KTN run uh, in close partnership with UKRI, Innovate UK, that tackle some of the key challenges that we face as, um, as a nation and indeed globally. So uh, things like climate change, um, that is obviously a big focus for KTN. And in this case, um, Made Smarter has, has emerged, uh, focused initially at least on the productivity agenda, but also tackling uh, yeah, that, that net zero agenda, um, competitiveness of our manufacturing sector in the round. And yeah, how do we create a, a more, uh, resilient uh, manufacturing sector that is globally competitive. Next slide. So a bit of context on Made Smarter. So Made Smarter kicked off um, with a review uh, on behalf of uh, government, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So they asked Jürgen Meyer of Siemens um, to lead a team of industrialists to create a vision for the acceleration of the use of digital tech in manufacturing to improve productivity. From there, um, there were four main areas recommended, adoption, innovation, leadership and skills. So the adoption side of things saw a UK investment in a pilot in the Northwest. Um, and now that's getting expanded out to three new regions, the Northeast, Yorkshire and Humber and the West Midlands. This is a program focused on productivity improvement through technology adoption. The leadership and skills activity um, has been led by Ingenuity. Uh, that can be seen on their Engage platform. But finally, the, the strand that we're involved in supporting the innovation strand of the program is led by um, what was formerly at least known as the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund team at Innovate UK. Um, so this program is, is known as the Manufacturing Made Smarter Challenge, which is an, an ambitious program over the next three years, investing over 300 million to support manufacturers, digital tech developers, founders and academics to innovate solutions to support the increase of productivity in the manufacturing sector in the UK and to create a, a UK based technology base 
Um, uh, you know, so we're not just buying in technology for industry for from abroad. There are a number of interventions already underway. So for instance, the collaborative R&D uh, competition uh, number one um, that ran 18 months ago, um, fast start projects, um, and uh, there's a, been a second a collaborative R&D competition on digital supply chain. There's a Made Smarter Digital Accelerator and an Innovation Hubs pilot. So an awful lot going on, and it's our role here at KTN with our innovation network over the next four years um, to try and join all this activity together, provide a front door, if you like, to the right part of the Made Smarter Innovation program. Um, part of what we are doing is developing a, a, a portal working with um, the Northwest pilot and the other pilot regions that is a, a single point of entry online uh, to, to Made Smarter and all its strands. A bit more on the network activity. So, yeah, uh, including this webinar series. Um, through this four year programme, we're aiming to promote the communication of the latest projects, technologies, and developments, and develop a community of collaborators innovating to support productivity improvements in UK manufacturing way past the remit of the Made Smarter funded initiatives. In this webinar series, we wanted to, to give insights into the art of the possible starting from the viewpoint of the manufacturer. We know there are very few plug and play solutions for our diverse manufacturing sector in the UK, and there's always some integration and innovation needed, and therefore some pain to be experienced before the results start to flow. So it's these stories that we're wanting to air. There's so much great work going on around the UK uh, and the Made Smarter Innovation Network, Made Smarter.UK portal will be our way of sharing the stories and spreading the knowledge and success of this community. So do, do keep looking at our communications. We'll, we'll do our best to keep you updated. Following this webinar, we'll be uh, yeah, following up with information on how you can stay in the loop and in, in all this exciting stuff going on here about new funding, new collaboration opportunities, and so on. Next slide, please, Anita. So this, um, this slide aims to at least get across some of the uh, breadth of what we're doing in our network, supporting Made Smarter Innovation, covering various cross-cutting themes and uh, different sectors uh, of manufacturing. Next uh, slide. So we've got dedicated staff uh, across KTN teams who are supporting in specialist areas. So, um, I mean, I'm not gonna go through them all, but just as a, a way of example, we've got specialists in robotics, immersive tech, and then in terms of sectors, nuclear, chemicals, um, in terms of um, the um, sort of cross-cutting themes, we've got a, a focused activity on net zero, um, innovation exchange, et cetera, et cetera, access to funding and finance. Um, so yeah, lots of staff involved from across our various teams here at KTN. Next slide, please, Anita. Um, we're developing activity plans across all sectors and technology areas. Yeah, advance the next ones, Anita, to the, to the bottom. Um, yeah, engaging with known networks, scouring for new technologies, and yeah, trying to join everything up for the benefit of, of the tech base and manufacturing at large. Next, please. Yeah, um, one key activity we're doing is scouting out stories of change. Um, we do want your case studies. I think that's the next slide. If you progress up to the next one, Anita. Yeah, so we've got, um, yeah, a, a, a key task on our hands over the next four years as part of our network, um, yeah, to try and share the very best stories. So the, the, these are two live calls we've got out at the moment. We're trying to put together a show reel of exciting stories as a kind of video. Um, and yeah, you see the link on the left-hand side there. Um, again, we'll share this with you. Um, and yeah, if you have stories of the use of these technologies and would like to feature in a show reel, do please yeah, follow that link. 
On the other hand, um, we're, we're publishing stories on our website, uh, on, on, on the Made Smarter website, that is. Um, so uh, yeah, in, a, any, any, in any of those bullet points in particular, if you've got a story of adoption of um, technology in a manufacturing sector or innovation particularly, um, do get in touch. Um, it's a good opportunity to promote yourselves and to inspire others to, uh, to learn from what you've achieved. Next. So um, I know you've all been itching to get to the exciting bit. This is uh, where I introduce the panel, a great uh, series of speakers for you today, um, who will able, be able to tell, to tell a, a joined up story of the use of technologies to drive that focus on customer value through servitization and the adoption of digital technologies as part of that. Um, so yeah, first up, we've got Alec Anderson of Cool Mill um, who are innovating in the area of rice mill technology um, across the world. Um, Keith uh, of Siemens who will be uh, telling a story of how um, their tech has, has enabled that. Jen from Egg Lighting, uh, an SME innovator, and finally Ian McKechnie from Aston, who will be uh, giving some, some kind of closing words, particularly on the business model side of things. But over to uh, Alex, uh, uh, Alec from Cool Milk, my great privilege to introduce Alec, and over to you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, good morning, I'm Alec. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cool Milk. And uh, I've been asked to talk about our experience of, uh, of uh, servitization, or for us as machinery as a service, as we try to introduce this to a very different industry. We work in rice. Rice is a $550 billion global industry. It feeds half the world every day. Our job is to turn rough rice or paddy as it comes out of the field into the white rice you would buy in the supermarket. Uh, we do that with uh, very gently, with less power. Um, less loss and less damage. For the rice, nothing moves faster in the world of rice. After 8,000 years, uh, we are the third generation of technology and automation, digitalization, and modern technologies don't, uh, don't tend to exist in, in this industry. The problem we're trying to solve is that enough rice to feed 600 million people uh, will, not, will be lost each year from field to fork. And uh, that's an estimated loss of around 93 billion pounds. There is uh, a small number, or there, there are a small number of large commercial uh, mills which have a degree of automation. At one end of the scale, we can load uh, two 28 uh, ton trailers in less than two minutes in some of the larger mills. But typically, uh, rice is handled in sacks manually uh, multiple times during processing for, for most of the world. And this on the left is a typical uh, uh, rural rice mill. And these uh, mills are excluded from access to modern technology. Uh, they don't have the money to buy the technology, they don't have the infrastructure so, to support it, and, and uh, they don't have the capacity to keep it running. So poor storage, poor processing equals massive loss. The machine on the right is digitally connected and can replace most of the machinery on the left. The question is, how do we get that machinery into the hands of these SME mills? Who need that equipment. And that's where the servitization model uh, comes into its own. Uh, as I said before, we use machinery as a service, uh, as our business model. Probably um, Rolls Royce powered by the hour would be the nearest equivalent to what we are trying to do. But what we found is that uh, servitization is heavily dependent on data and digitalization. If you don't have, you can't have one without the other, as the famous song goes. But what it does do for us is it overcomes the barriers to adoption. So we are a small company with a disruptive technology. So there's a, a nervousness about that, that technology. So uh, servitization means that we take that technology risk. And there's also a perception that we are expensive. That's a perception, not a reality. But by moving away from a high capital cost purchase into a, a, a pay as you mill option, if you like, gives the uh, end user uh, cost certainty. So we've eliminated the risk of the technology and we've taken away the cost uh, barrier. That makes our uh, technology affordable and accessible uh, and available to these smaller millers. And really for us, uh, the focus is about changing the mindset. It's a cultural shift. 
Right now, Rice is focused on cost reduction to squeeze a margin. We want to change that focus to value creation. It's not about the cost, it's about the value. But to make it work, you've got to digitalize. Uh, why? Well, we, we have to create value. Uh, how are we going to effectively deploy that? It's not a westernized society. Most rice is in rural areas, often uh, poorly served with, uh, with infrastructure power. Uh, certainly no landlines. We do have digital communications or mobile communications uh, sometimes. In India, the farmers have bumped down the mass, so that doesn't help. Um, and then obviously there's a, a there's a, a need to actually drill down. What do we actually need to create that value? You can get lots of shiny new toys, but they don't always add value. So then we look at the technology. What do we actually need? How are we going to source the data? What are we going to do with the data once we have it? And how are we going to connect it all together? Now, if only there was a vendor out there willing to sell us some equipment, that would make life really simple, wouldn't it? Um, vendors want to squeeze your problem into their solution. Uh, and that uh, uh, can be an issue. So one size is not likely to fit all. So how are you going to identify what you need and then how are you going to make it all connect together? And we've been working with Siemens uh, on a couple of Innovate UK projects, one to create a digital rice mill and one's a digital demonstrator for self-assization. And we're working really at the field level with, uh, with Siemens. Uh, we started off with the theory that we would bring data back in real time from the machines, do something with it and send back information to the machines. That was quickly uh, ruled out as not being uh, viable. So we're now looking at an edge-based system which will operate the machines on a day-to-day -day basis. But a secondary aspect of that is, uh, is really about the, as the population of machines grows by collecting the data and sending uh, packets of data back to a central repository where we can uh, apply analytics and machine learning to that data to identify things in the data that uh, we just couldn't pick up uh, manually or um, a human couldn't identify these things in the mill. What that enables us to do is move rice milling from a reactive management to a proactive or preemptive management. And bearing in mind that um, the servitization model is for me a bit like a spread bet. You can make a lot of money if you get it right. You can lose a lot of money if you get it wrong. So our guarantee to the customer is uptime. So we are on penalties when we have downtime. So how, how can we uh, minimize that downtime? Um, so identifying early uh, issues is, is a real key aspect for us. In terms of the theme and software that we're using, we use MindSphere and uh, we, we produce dashboards from that. Um, and really it's about the connectivity and the open access to that uh, connectivity. So we can bring data from different sensors and different suppliers all back to a central point and then uh, do something with it. So now we create uh, this industry 4.0 data-driven real-time auto-tuning. Now another uh, aspect of servitization is that by having that data and being able to do something with that data, it opens up the opportunity to create uh, further uh, revenue generating uh, services. So if we can take that real time data from the environment, from the rice, from the machine, if we can do some analytics on that data, if we can reconfigure those machines in real time to make sure the machines are all running optimally at all times, then the value we can generate over a long term contract far outweighs the cost of the machinery. So it's about that creation of the value. And the other aspect of servitization is that how do you get your share of that value? We hear a lot about big data and it's dead easy to correct, collect data, masses and masses and masses of data these days. But what data do you want? What data has value? What data can you monetize? And that's the key. So we're looking at, uh, you know, Things like, uh, well, for us, our key, our key performance indicator is really the broken rice. So how can we minimize broken rice? And that's where the value is. So if we can monitor that in real time and adjust the machine, uh, that, that's our, our uh, value for our end users. As I say, once we've optimized, our, our, it's about optimization for us. So we've captured that data. Um, I think there's a, a in, in the short term in, on the, the operational side, we're looking at the brokens. On the long term uh, analytics, we're looking at a, a continuous improvement program. Where, where is the machine performing? How do the machines perform comparatively against each other? So, if we have similar machines in a similar area, they should be performing similarly. If one is performing badly, 
uh, then we want to know why does that operator need uh, further intervention. If somebody's suddenly doing something that's really good, we want to know that too, because we want to share that amongst the whole population for the benefit of all. But we're a, a, an, an SME from the UK working in a, a, a global industry competing with massive multinationals. And we're trying to support and supply small processors who've been excluded from high performance markets. You know, and So what could possibly go wrong? And can we deliver this digitalized modern future rice milling uh, to, to these uh, uh, end users? And I'm going to say, yes, we can. So through our projects with Siemens, we've now got a pilot mill here in Sheffield where I am today, and also uh, another pilot mill in Samana and the Punjab. And both of these mills are connected uh, digitally and uh, we can uh, connect to the Indian mill through 4G mobile communications and here in Sheffield through 4 or 5G uh, mobile communications. So we can look at those machines and the performance in real time uh, and we can monitor exactly what's happening. Another key point, or uh, an absolutely essential point for a standardization contract, you've got to know what's happening with your equipment given the guarantees and the contract models you all entered into. Uh, COVID has forced us to reconsider the whole travel aspect and the, ge and the, you know, the geographical nature of our business. So we've uh, developed a digital toolkit uh, which combines uh, IoT uh, and, uh, and virtual reality or augmented reality. So we're using a HoloLens uh, headset. And again, looking at the penalty side, when a machine's down, that's costing us money. So how can we get, or how can we stop it going down in the first place? And if we can't, how can we resolve issues very quickly? So we can now support our local engineers uh, via the HoloLens headset. They can see hands-free uh, what's happening uh, on the machine. They can control the machine from the headset. And we can see in real time what they are seeing. So we can then uh, connect to a, a qualified engineer here in the UK. We can augment his screen so we can put circles, arrows. We can put engineering drawings, PDFs, videos. All of that sort of information is available to the operator. So we can help him to uh, recover the situation much more quickly and cost effectively for us. So just to summarize, why do you want to do servitization? And it's really about creating that shared value and getting your fair share of that shared value. Sell a machine once, that's what you get. Create value, you get a continual recurring income. How are we going to do it? Well, you've really got to work on your contract cost and value models. And that's, uh, we're asking that, uh, our advanced services group will be really helping us with that. And when you start out, don't get uh, dragged into all the, the bells and whistles. Look at what is actually necessary to create that shared value. And I think that's my 10 minutes up. So. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alec. And uh, yeah, what a, what a great introduction to today's theme that is uh, demonstrating how digital um, can enable that, that, that shared value, additional value creation. Um, and yeah, great to hear how a UK based SME is providing technology that, yeah, is serving a, a global need. Um, so next up is Keith from Siemens, who's going to um, talk a bit about how Siemens uh, have been helping um, Cool Mill and others uh, in their journeys to servitization. Cheers. Thank you uh, very much. Hopefully uh, everybody can hear me uh, and, and see my slides. Um, yeah, it's, it's really is an exciting time. I mean, Siemens obviously is a technology company in the, in the thick of thick of all of this that's going on at the moment, there's a, there's a pretty much a perfect storm in terms of technology deployment. Um, uh, as Ben said early on, we were absolutely involved with the Made Sparta review. Um, and um, one of the things that excited me because uh, I, I head up the uh, our food and beverage business for UK and Ireland was where food and drink would sit in that report. And uh, I was half expecting that uh, you know, automotive, aerospace would be the the, the big uh, 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 beneficiaries of, of of the report. But actually, what came out was food and drink was the second biggest sector to to gain from uh, automation digitalization to the tune of around about fifty eight billion pounds of benefits over over ten years. So it was absolutely key to the future of the sector that the deployment of of technology is going to make a a, a massive a massive difference. So uh, uh, extremely uh, excited about that. Um, so about this perfect storm, well, um, in food production and uh, obviously other, other manufacturing sectors will, would, would have similar challenges, I guess, but I think the food industry is pretty unique 
in terms of um, raw ingredients, as, as uh, Alec has just uh, gone through, and then right through that process to uh, get it to a consumable uh, state. Um, but when you look at the, the both the global um, demands, whether it's the population growth, whether it's the increasing demand from developing countries, um, there's, a, there's a clear thread here that increase requirements with limited resources is never a good thing to to do so there has to be a a focus on efficiency um just on the the sheer uh, uh, bare clear uh, objectives of, of of that you know um if 25 percent of food is wasted in production processing consumption uh then sh- surely there's an area there that we can we can focus on to to become more efficient and reduce that waste but it is challenging. It's not not that easy. Certainly, when you're talking about global global uh, change, climate change, um, intensification of of nature's hazards, if you like, um, damage and loss of production, degradation of natural resources. These are big topics that you you can't quite easily change instantly. So you have to do things to 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 support that. Um, and and along with all of that is is the lack of of Customer choice and and trust. So, um, can you can you guarantee when you buy a product off the shelf that it is what it is? And and uh, and is it is it as we go forward and we start to measure uh, uh, carbon on the product and and, the, and its supply chain? Can we trust the data that it has? So, clearly there has to be a lot of validation and verification along the way. In all of these areas, the the, the, the middle part of all of this is data. Uh, and it's trusted data, and, and data develops uh, into efficiencies. And so there's clearly a, um, a, a technology piece that's going to accelerate the deployment uh, of these efficiency gains um, going forward. So what does it really do for a, a, a food manufacturer? Um, and Alec, of course, uh, supplying into the sector. Uh, you know, it's, it's all about um, speed. So if you're now a manufacturer that's trying to obviously uh, reduce its carbon footprint, then that's clearly something you'd like to do quicker uh, um, rather than slower, because it's a, it's a, one, it's a cost saving as as well as a uh, um, a, a carbon reduction uh, process. But if you're looking at the food industry in general, then you're looking at lots of different types of products, and speed to market is clearly uh, something that has to be done. So you've got to get your products to market quickly. You've got to have it very, very good. It's got to have that quality assurance that goes through with all of that. Um, You've got to be more reactive, more agile to various different things that's coming through. The pandemic has clearly identified the the, the need to be flexible in in certain food production. Um, But a lot of companies can't react, can't respond because there's not that agility in the manufacturing process to, to achieve that. And through all of this, these challenges, efficiency is right through the heart of it. So uh, how, are you, how are we going to do that? And we're going to talk about the digitalization and, and, uh, and how that's going to make, uh, make that through. But if you can actually bring speed, flexibility, quality, and efficiency together in a technology establishment, then what creates is new business models. Because some of this is really clump complex and it creates a significant amount of value. And if you can then turn that value, as Alex says, is monetize that value, then that automatically creates that business model. But I said earlier that data is at the heart of all of this uh, and uh, uh, connected data, one source of the truth whether it's through a fleet of your machines or whether it's across a production line or whether it's your supply chain. And when you're connecting data, you then inherently come into potential security, cybersecurity issues. So you can't just go through a development of deploying digitalization and automation and connected data without also covering cybersecurity because now you're vulnerable. And that vulnerability where you gain on your performance, you could now be vulnerable if you've not got a good cybersecurity process in place. So they have to be aligned to that. And that's really important to to note. So digitalization, 
changes everything. It changes everything. It, it, it's continually changing our own lives. Um, and there's no, then absolutely in, in manufacturing and in uh, certainly the food industry, that's what will, will, will take place. But I wouldn't get too hung up on the term digitalization because it means probably absolutely nothing or, or many things to many people. It's just a word. What we're really talking about is continuous improvement and continuous improvement using digital tools to actually achieve what we're trying to achieve. So uh, sometimes language is one of the things that uh, is a barrier. Uh, and, uh, and um, you know, I, I, do, I do think that certainly in the food industry, it's all about continuous improvement and, um, and these new digital tools will make a significant difference um, into, the, the, into the deployment of those uh, returns on investment and business performance. So as we go through this journey, the, the key key aspects, and these are the sort of applications and conversations that we are having with many of our our customers. And this is not, you know, our customer base is obviously at one side. You've got uh, maybe Cool Mill down at the uh, the SME end. So this is something that is 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 is, is um, across the whole sector to multi billion um, uh, companies, Unilever and companies coca-cola and all these big companies also so this is affecting everybody but everybody is starting it generally with connectivity in that automation so they may have automated they may have they have systems in place but it's getting that connectivity because it's only when you get connectivity in different parts of that starts to deliver the visibility of what's really going on and you can't improve anything unless you can measure so the visibility is really important that gives you the transparency, what's happening. But it doesn't give you the solution. It just gives you, this is what could be happening. Root cause analysis can be brought into that as well. And then you start to then build this position of prediction and adaption. And when you get to prediction and adaption, that's when you can start to really get some significant value. And the servitization model then comes into its own. Because now you're predicting when things could happen. The food industry is full of variability. The sheer nature of what it is, it's a, it's a raw ingredient that reacts and responds to, to nature as it goes through its process. And as Alex Machine's a perfect example, he's looking to adapt and, and to the conditions in the, in the, the, uh, in, in the mill, um, whether it's humidity, whether it's um, uh, heat that's going to affect the machine performance. But if he can predict and adapt to that, He's optimizing his performance irrespective of the variability that comes through. And if you can think of a production line acting the same way, in a hot day, they get potentially, if you're trying to put chocolate through a, through a, through a production line, a hot day is probably the worst thing you could have because you just get the viscosity changes and they get a lot of clog ups and they get a lot of problems as the product goes through. So if you can start to predict that and adapt the performance, then there's an awful lot of value that's wrapped into that. And that's where... Like I say, the digitalization piece is really starting to become clear. So what is it, what is it really all about? It's about connecting the virtual world with the real world. And I'll give you some examples. We're doing some studies around where process optimization, where we're looking at maybe just a, a, a simple mix in, in, a, in, a, in a process of ingredients. Um, We've done some uh, using some computational fluid dynamics that, that we have. It's a, it's a brand called Star CCM Plus of Siemens. Um, Alec is using it uh, also in terms of working out the, uh, the flow of the rice through his machine uh, to optimize the performance of, of, of the rice brokens as it gets, uh, gets milled. But you can apply this to many, many fluid states. And uh, we're looking at taking mixing times, which was 30 minutes down to five minutes through a little bit of design optimization, but you can start to see if that was a, a big, which it is a big, a big uh, uh, flower producer that can optimize 25 minutes per mix uh, with the volume that's going through, the value that's wrapped up in that is, is, is into the millions uh, over, over a, a, certainly over a, a year whether it's a decarbonization, you're not running the motors as much, or you're creating capacity to get more mixes in the same footprint. And as the first slide uh, uh, identified, uh, making more with less is pretty much what we're trying to achieve all the way through. 
So we have our, we can model this, this virtual model. So we can start to optimize the performance of the, the, the equipment, the machine. And then we have the real data that's coming from the machine back in or from the production line that's going to not only verify the, the, the simulation, but it's also then going to look at the, uh, what the what if scenarios or what if we could we get another 10% capacity? What happens to the model if we increase the speed? What happens to the model if the viscosity starts to slightly change because the temperature goes up? And you can collate all of this wonderful data uh, locally through uh, industrial edge on the, the various different machine starts so that we're not emitting too much data into the cloud. But then the big data piece in the cloud is then looking at all sorts of different variables that could have an impact where the data exists in companies, but in silos. So it's not connected data. When you can start to bring it all together into, uh, into, a, into a matrix that is identifying the real picture, shift patterns, training patterns, as well as the technology and the environmental conditions, the root cause of your potential efficiency starts to uh, you decode that. And once you've got that position, you're now in a position where you can start to wrap that, that servitization piece around it because you're now creating that value in the, in, in the pieces. And so we're seeing no end of different as a service models. I mean, we as a Siemens, we offer energy reduction as a service uh, and, uh, and uh, process performance as a service as well. But that you can see the way this is going. I mean, Alec will be, you know, he's got it as a service model. We've got other OEMs that are using our equipment that is in a paper wrap or paper fill model because they're optimizing the performance for that particular company. And it'll keep on going as more and more companies start to see that there's, there's so much more value rather than the capital cost of the equipment to be had by bringing the virtual to the real. You start to see some massive uh, improvements and the acceleration of the deployment of the technology that needs to take place to achieve uh, the business benefits that, that we need. So on, on, on that note, I will, I will leave it there. And, uh, and uh, I, I, any questions, I'd love to uh, uh, answer them later on, uh, but I'll pass it back over to, uh, to Ben. Real. Thank you, Keith. And I'll move without uh, pausing uh, through to introducing Jen Griffiths from Egg Lighting, who's going to pick up on that theme of, uh, that Keith mentioned, of making more with less uh, as part of a servitization, digitalization journey. Over to you, Jen. All right. Well, thank you guys for having me along today. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Jennifer Griffith. I am the Circular Project Support Officer at Egg Lighting. Uh, that means I'm responsible for guiding our remanufacturing strategy and best practice on our data-driven luminaire remanufacture project. A little bit about background about egg lighting. Um, we have been trading since 2013. We're based in Glasgow. Um, we have 27 employees currently, which we're actually very proud of because that has increased during the pandemic. Um, we've made our name as specialists in the business to business lighting sector, mostly for doing everything under one roof, that is lighting design, supply and install. So why is it that we are pursuing a servitization model? Um, what I'd say is that servitization is not the end goal for our business but it is a key enabler, a step in the process towards where we really want to be, which is a viable circular economy business model. That's along with the steps you see prior to it, um, which is avoiding race to bottom and remanufacture, which I'm going to be touching on uh, today as well. So you probably have seen this slide a million times already. This is uh, the circular economy process from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Just a quick, quick recap from people who aren't so familiar with it. The circular economy is a systematic approach to economic development designed to benefit businesses, society, and the environment. These are the values that my colleagues and I want to work towards and we want to promote uh, as a company, which is why uh, a service is the end goal for egg lighting as a service that is. Um, I'm also going to take a second to focus on remanufacture. Um, we are pursuing this because it's seen as the most sophisticated process within the circular economy. Um, it's especially most appropriate for technological products such as with LED lighting. That's largely because products which are highly technological often come, uh, become obsolete before the material itself does. So EGG have been continuously developing our in-house remanufacturing capabilities for a number of years now. 
By taking a life cycle approach, we can use quality to compete against the race to the bottom. So industrial LEDs aren't like your traditional light bulb where you can just switch one in and out again. They require a lot more skill and effort to upgrade. We choose to provide remanufacturing services because, well, we're not about to have the capabilities to die cast a hundred thousand new panels on a purpose built production line. But we can look to retain the value and the materials that we already have in Scotland, in the UK, and stop those assets from depreciating. Uh, for us, it's much more feasible to repair something than making it from scratch. Uh, we believe this is a it creates a unique opportunity and offering for us as an SME when competing against multinational firms, especially in a highly priced competitive industry. So the opportunity, um, LED efficiency is always improving. In the last 10 years, LED uh, efficiency has increased approximately 200%. If you only change your lighting every 10 to 15 years, then you lose out on that efficiency and the associated energy savings. Our current goal is to increase the lifespan up to 25 years and each of those steps on that blue line there, um, those represent us coming back to you and upgrading them. So typically we can provide manufactured goods at 30% of their original cost and that's five opportunities for us um, to save on uh, cost and waste. It's so five opportunities to bring back your lights in line with the maximum efficiency available on the market as opposed to throwing it the material into landfill. Um, by looking at pairing a service with our products, we're invested in longer timescales. We have an incentive to reverse value depreciation. We can make products more affordable long term. So this is what kind of remanufacture to me ends up looking like. This is what our product is the flagship product of our remanufacturable range it's called Stroma. I'm personally very proud to have been involved in the development. We have won a number of awards relating to this project. It's essentially bringing back the light bulbs in the form of those strips there and a little process behind it. Um, the key features of this are its durable design, quality components, upgradable design and easy disassembly. They all ensure the stroma can be upgraded multiple times with minimum, minimum associated labour costs. So now what? <laughs> we can upgrade it and that is great. But realistically, no one's ever going to look at their warehouse lighting in five years time and think to themselves that perhaps it's only performing at 70% of what it could be. We're the ones that have to check up and maintain those products in order to achieve their maximum efficient energy and material efficiency. A product itself isn't circular. It's how it's the service that retains the value and how it finds its way back to us. So this leads me to two distinct offerings in Able Service Station. Um, what I've been talking to about so far is largely being remanufactured, leading to an upgrade as a service. Um, for the upgrade model, we've been developing a digital passport. Sounds quite like uh, Alex Digital Twin he was talking about, um, which allows data to be held with each light in order to then maintain it. The core service we provide in this model is the knowledge for how to maximize the value of the product by prolonging its, its life and use and recycling those parts that have reached their end of life safely and in compliance with the current standards. The box on the right is lighting as a service. Um, LAS adds a digital layer to a facility using a Bluetooth mesh network to enable intelligent management, proactive maintenance and increased functionality. But to dependently provide either of these services, what we need is data. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. So to complement the stroma, we needed a digital twin or digital passport. The idea is an open data standard which grants user access to liminaire supply chain history, where it's been used and for how long it's been there. This can be done through the simple scan of a QR code, which is unique to every luminaire. We believe that whoever comes across our product should be able to access those details. So it's an open data standard. Importantly, this data means we can facilitate component lifespan projections to carry out preventative maintenance and it would help any remanufacturer assign a value to that product and its components. They are much more confident assessing their product quality and the ability to repair and dismantle it. By doing this, EGG is looking at product life cycles over the long term. Ultimately, we want to make lights that last as long as the building. To do that, we have to ensure the product is fully serviceable by future generations. 
commercial lighting is well placed to become the backbone of the IoT. So that's the internet of things. Um, so lighting systems are ideally situated to offer a backbone for data transfer via a mesh topology. What I'm trying to say there is that um, your lights are already placed equidistant over an entire facility. They're already connected to mains electricity. They're also uh, already paired with sensors. To give a bit of an example, um, an occupancy sensor might be installed in every light. Currently, it's just there to turn the light on and off, but you could use it for so much more if you digitize it. Sensors combined with Bluetooth could transfer data from anything around or below them. If you had a low powered, low cost Bluetooth transmitter that is, such as in pallet deliveries or visitor passes. We've actually already developed paired digital platforms for some of our clients in order to carry out remote emergency light testing, which saves them a lot of money and is obviously a, a very dependable system. And we can show real time data about immediate surroundings overlaid onto a blueprint of the facilities layout. So what other ideas do we have? Um, I don't have time to go into all the additional functions today, but needless to say, the sky is the limit. This platform is designed to be open to future technologies, to create a robust network for your entire building's data infrastructure. That is, it's, it lets other um, technologies pair with it. So that's from your HVAC system to one of my personal favorites, uh, the control of your indoor light color um, in line with those reddish to bluish tones you see from sunrise to sunset. This has a lot to do with health and well-being and has a lot of associated benefits for patients with dementia or night shift workers. It's small changes like this that could make a dramatic difference to the fight against climate change and to people's lives. So I've highlighted that data and digital technology are enabling our servitization models. The other thing we found essential is collaboration. We haven't done all the work that goes into this on our own. We've had many partners, clients and organizations have helped us bring these ideas to life, um, particularly um, are the ones developing the digital passport um, with us and Snook are the ones we've ta been talking to about various servitization models for them to confirm what the industry actually wants and what there's an app for. Uh, the whole supply chain needs to be on board for a circular service to work. Okay, so in summary, our circular services are designed to benefit one, businesses, um, by retaining the product's value, we're able to provide an as new goods at reduced price to the customers. We want to facilitate upgrades in line with new technology and functions as they're developed, rather than overhauling an entire system every 20 years at prohibitive expense. Two, society. By embedding physical products with a digital passport the, and IoT technology, we're able to capture and analyze data that improves the spaces people live and work in. And three, the environment. We are capturing the data needed to maintain these products with their highest energy and material efficiency for us and by future generation. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time and attention today. Um, if you want to know more about our work or ask any questions, please feel free to email me. All the details are on there. And I'd recommend heading over to our website to download our recently published um, 2021 white paper on the justification for remanufacturing the lighting industry. It's a riveting read. I truly enjoy it. And with that, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, yeah, once again, do get your questions into the chat box. Um, but without further ado, um, it's my honour now to introduce Ian McKechnie. So Ian's from Aston University and uh, yeah, a, a leader globally uh, on the topic of servitization and the digitalization. Over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, so very quickly, the Advanced Services Group are based at Aston Business School in Birmingham. Uh, as Ben said, we're a centre of excellence. We focus purely on two topics, one being servitization and the other being advanced services, which is a particular element of the, the business model process around servitization. So we're a group of about 30 individuals. Uh, this is one of our big events coming up later in the year, which is focused purely for the manufacturing community and Servitization Live will bring you over three days, everything as a service. So I'll pick up on particular with the work that Alex is doing and with Keith at Siemens and with Jennifer at Egg. So I think there's a lot there to see, but that provides the context. Why is it relevant? Well, 
Professor Tim Baines uh, is the number one cited academic in the world for the term servitization and advanced services. And the book that he wrote a number of years ago talked about three different types of services. And you have base, where it's really about spare parts, warranty, just making the product available. You then have a second level at intermediate, where you're really focusing on the, perhaps using data, uh, sensors, feedback loops, training, help desk, et cetera, to get the most out of the actual product or asset itself. So it's all about the condition. When you are in a servitized world, the area we're really interested in is this one called advanced services. And that's where you start moving away from providing just the asset as a single transaction, but you then turn it into the provision of a service and you use the product as a platform for the delivery of the service. So all of a sudden you're turning from selling things to customers to working with customers and co-creating new value. And the thing that struck me from particularly Alec and Keith earlier on was their constant referral to the term value. And that's what this is all about. It's about trying to understand where the value lies and how can you make your customer more successful. However, this is what it looks like when you start. This is an interview cloud from a chief exec that took his company from 50 million to 600 million. And we have looked at this in great detail using all the clever people that work within the advanced services group. And we've created this transformation roadmap. And you'll see that as firms navigate from left to right, there are four distinct phases that they will go through where they experience different things that we've highlighted on these various call out points. But in essence, it's about understanding what it might mean to you as a business. How can you get engagement and buy-in within your organization? How can you then start working with customers to run scale and small pilots uh, to allow you to then expand the offering of these services? And ultimately, it's about making sure that both you and your customer are more successful. The topic today was particularly uh, Keith from Siemens and the Mindsphere perspective, is that that bottom part of this graphic talks about technology-centric forces. And that's where Internet of Things and Gen in particular with egg lighting, that's where a lot of the value will come because you understand the product in use. And you can use that data and insight to help inform the redesign of the product from a circular economy perspective, but you're also dematerializing. So you're redesigning products that use fewer raw materials in the first place but still provide that capability. So it's very powerful. I've taken Alec as an example today. So this is where Alec started perhaps. Alec would argue that he has been servitizing for 25 plus years. Uh, he perhaps just didn't know there was a term then. Uh, we started working with Alec about 2014 and what we've been party to is his very successful transit from the left-hand side of this diagram to the right-hand side and we've been very fortunate to be part of projects with Alec. Uh, we, we helped that activity by looking at our advanced services staircase, which helps firms understand where they are and where they could go to. But ultimately, we're looking to try and get companies as far up this continuum as possible to look at the asset capability or the process or ultimately the wider platform or the ecosystem. So there's a lot there that we can talk about in detail. Uh, but perhaps the, the most useful slide for today's presentation from my perspective is this one, where we have a very simple representation of the four phases that companies need to go through to understand how to add more value. The top left, I spend about 60% of my time helping companies develop their customer value proposition. About 10% in the top Right, where we're looking at the internal requirements and the way that you will deliver and create that value. The bottom left, 10% of the time, how you will be paid for it and how your customers and you will benefit from different types of cash flow. And the bottom right, about 10% about being innovative about how you can be competitive in that space. If you've been counting the percentages, there's about 10% missing and that's really about storytelling. And we use a lot of storytelling research to help actually the manufacturers present their case to the customer for the provision of these more advanced services. And for today's presentation, this is where I think each of the firms and the speakers that they represented 
our position. So we've done a lot with Alec to help him understand the value proposition. I think, Jen, you're perhaps in this position at the moment where you're looking to move from that value into the right-hand side where you're looking at transferring that data. Uh, but you've got a journey to go and we'd love to have a conversation about that. Uh, where I think, obviously, Kumil and Siemens, the top right, we've been working with Keith and Alec on a next generation rice milling project. And that's using the MindSphere and Mendix platform to understand actually what's happening behind the scenes. We've done some work with Alec on that same project where we helped him create a business model, a revenue model and a contract model so that Alec can get paid effectively and that the margins are there to allow him to sustain the whole service. And on that bottom right hand side there, it's all about that competitive advantage. And where that leads us to is a 1.7 million project that we secured for manufacturing made smarter. Uh, ben was instrumental in helping us guide him through the process, through the KTN. Uh, we also worked with Abby Hurt, uh, who helped us with a lot of the introductions. But basically what we're doing is we're building a digital servitization demonstrator with BD after Mayor or Banksy Heating, as you may know them. You'll see some of the partners in the project there with Cool Mill and Siemens represented. We have a number of work packages that we're using to develop this demonstrator. Uh, but really, it's all about getting the, the data connections happening with the boiler or, in Alex's case, with the rice milling machine. We're also working with people like Paul Jackson from UV Light, connecting a UV light source, so providing disinfectant as a service. But using a lot of our frameworks and research models to allow us to move forward, where actually these tools that we create are all part of the wider journey for manufacturers. Where does that leave us? Well, we have created this uh, rendering on uh, courtesy of Maxi, where we have a 45 square, square meter space where we will bring firms in to help them with their own digital servitization journey. Uh, and again, that's supported with Alec and the Siemens. But I'm delighted to say that Maxi have seen so much value in this that they're actually creating the demonstrator as part of their new training and innovation center the flagship hub in Solihull. So that opens in August this year. The demonstrator will be a significant part of that, but it will allow visitors to come and see how heating as a service is actually delivered, the business models, the IoT connections, the data, the underlying platforms, that all allow that business model to thrive so that you can extract the value that you create for your customer. And again, just a quick reminder that October 4th to 6th is when our event will happen. We have lots of case studies and books, including one there that we created with Alex help. And we have different ways of engagement. But I'll hand back to Ben now because I'm just mindful of time then. Brilliant. Many thanks, Ian. Um, so we've got time for a, a, a quick Q&A. So, um, yeah, we've had some questions in from the audience, but uh, do feel free to type in more um, along perhaps with the name of the panelists that you want to put the question to. So I'll, I'll kick off with a couple from the audience that we've had in already. Um, so for Alec, um, so this was from Jen, actually. How long will your con contract last with your customers, with your end users? And how will you give confidence to them that, that you'll be around for the, for the duration of that contract? I think we've learned anything in the last year is that uh, we've never planned more than a week in advance, do we? Um, it's about building trust. Uh, we're moving away from a conventional customer supplier relationship where you're negotiating in an adversarial manner to working very collaboratively on a trust based system. That takes time to develop. Uh, I, I don't know that anybody can guarantee that I'll be here in 10 years. I, I guess we've all had our double glazing guarantees, which turned out to be not worth the paper they're written on. Um, it's part of the uh, building the trust with the customer and, and uh, presenting the, uh, your brand and guarantee, I suppose. It takes time to build that and easily lost if you don't perform, I guess, is the, is the key there. In terms of length of contract, I suspect for more advanced mills, the contracts may be three to five years for the older mills, maybe uh, 10 years. Yeah, Ian, Keith, uh, any uh, additional insights on that one? Or Jen, if you want to elaborate or respond to the to the 
question, uh, build on the question. Um, yeah, it was just um, an interesting one for us. Uh, I very briefly mentioned a company called Snook, which did the um, uh, co-creation workshop with us, and that did come out as one of the main questions and um, pain points people had of mm -hmm. if we're going to be um, owning a, a service and owning those lights, what happens if if um, we go under uh, and so we had to provide trust when it's over long time scales like that and so I was just wondering how it is that you've approached that because obviously you've got the additional barrier there of being an entirely different continent uh, as uh, your customers and the yeah the kind of the pers the factors which help persuade people to trust in your model and trust in your service and you'll be there for them if anything does go wrong. Yeah, just to pick up on that again, we've we've uh, we've been lucky in that we've been funded by Innovate UK, and part of the project were partners, uh, end user partners in India. So we've had time to build that trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reputation. <laughs> yeah, I, I just add a little bit more to that as well. I mean, if if you were to buy traditionally the capital. Mm -hmm. then what's to say the machine company goes out of business after so it's exactly the same situation really yeah. i mean you're still going to try and support the machine and, and there's lots of machines that are in existence certainly in the food industry that were probably put there in the 70s uh, and uh, and just about hanging in there but they've managed to support them by one way or another you know they mm -hmm. they bought the capital many 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 years ago so i don't, I don't really see um too much difference and the benefit of of, of the servitization model for me is that on day one, the benefits are there without the capital outlay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, they, you, they, you can straight away get into a business a positive situation um, without that, without the, the trying to get the, the capital signed off. So I think there's so many more benefits from it. But I think culturally, I think there's still quite a way to go from companies to realize that this is a no brainer type of uh, situation uh, because I think culturally I'd certainly say the food industry is one of those companies or uh, sectors that you know it, it needs to be uh, see the, the the real proof before it dives into it mm -hmm. yeah I, I completely agree with that you definitely touched on in your presentation as well that the changing the norm um, and people's expectations and behaviors and associating more with value um, than cost uh, so I think that's what we're, we're hoping to move towards are so many benefits uh, that can be taken from servitization that I, I think it can be, you can definitely put a narrative forward to say it's worth moving your, your idea of what um, lighting for us should look like. Should it be access to the lights? Should it be access to digital services? Or do you want to own a product that will rust on your roof? We need to say to them, look, there's so much more you can get. Yeah. Ian, I'm sure you'll have some uh, insight on this one. I think it's an interesting one, uh, Jen. I think fantastic question because it, we've come across people like Alstom and GE in the past where they will offer 25-year contracts as a capability outcome-based contract. But they do so with the hindsight of 25 years of delivering a product. And so they, they have the data to understand and back up what they offer. But mm -hmm. Alex's point about working with India, uh, we've been close to Alec with the contract and the revenue models uh, because we are supporting that outcome-based contract activity. And I think there is a huge amount of activity that has to happen around about the relationship. But as you go through these various stages that you saw in perhaps the transformation roadmap, you build that engagement and empathy with the customer because you have a shared interest. You want to make them successful. Mm -hmm. And you're moving away from let's just sell as many products as we can to let's see who we can work with that creates the most value. Because it's that value that's then shared and that then goes back through the contract. Yes, actually, it's, it's interesting you're talking about that because it's hinting to me about things that I kind of tried to hint on within the presentation but didn't go into such as um, the value of remanufacture. It's kind of setting up that premise of creating a relationship with our customer, proving that we can do this, proving that we're not trying to hoodwink them. That was another thing that came up a lot. People um, think that servitization models have uh, hidden interest within them. Um, 
but we found that one of the collaborators on the slide as well was WH Malcolm. So they were very good at taking on um, projects with us. Genuinely, we've gone up to them and said to them, we want to trial lighting that we can remanufacture. Um, and then they've taken those, those lights on and uh, that's a very good kind of co-creation where they, we've proven to them over eight years now that we can up, we can um, uh, yeah, deliver what we say. And now it's get, about getting that digital passport. For us, that's going to take it from having this one relationship with one customer where we know we have a good relationship to be able to prove it with numbers, with statistics, to give that assurance that people can come back to us. So that's the yeah digital passport first. Um, and then hopefully helping people transition um, to a lighting service model once they have that confident in the, uh, confidence in us and in the model. Great, great. So conscious of time, if I, if I may move on, I th I, hopefully that, that was a useful discussion for all, all the um, audience there, you know, getting the perspective of, of, of someone on the journey, you know, very real question there. Um, that the businesses will face trying to move to this journey, this uh, this model. So, a question from Agnes. Um, it, I, uh, yeah, it's 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 a topic that is very broad. So, um, yeah, it's certainly one that that I and my colleagues are uh, exploring actively and and uh, learning about, learning how to approach. But it's it's kind of about the equality, diversity, diversity and inclusion side of things. So we've all heard about the digital divide. This could have impact both in, in the manufacturers, in the supply chain, in the end users, in the customers. Um, so yeah, if, if I may rephrase the question slightly, how can this, this, this data agenda that Keith referred to, the user focus that servitization brings, how can that facilitate or potentially hamper the inclusion agenda. I don't know if uh, if any of the panelists would like to have a stab at answering that one. And I can I can have a go at that one. We did put in a project uh, for an inclusive using the rice milling as an inclusive enabler uh, to uh, we would say gender neutral. Uh, our technology is gender neutral, so it's available to all regardless of size, location, or gender. I think if you look at the stats, particularly in Africa and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, women are excluded from access to the post-harvest uh, value chain. There's a, a big boys club where if you can afford the latest kit, you can make a lot of money. Uh, if you can't afford to get into the club, you're excluded. And I think uh, this remote distributed milling through the digital connectivity brings an inclusivity, makes it available to all. Uh, and that, that's really key. It's about bringing everybody, and that's not just the uh, women. That's about um, you know disabled people. Uh, it's about you know inclusive inclusivity in its its widest form. And you're looking at rural areas where there's a a massive disconnect. Uh, you know, even if you look at UK inside the M25, outside the M25. You know, you take that to Africa, and you're looking at a wider scope. So it's about it's about inclusivity, about making available and accessible. And, and that's where I think the civilization model can, can help because it takes away that financial barrier and the technical risk. Ian. Uh, just to support that, uh, Alec, we use a lot of uh, European regional development fund money to allow us to provide support to hundreds of manufacturing SMEs. And I'm always asked the question in the application form, how do you deal with EDI? Because there's a whole section that you've got to respond to. My simple standard response is that we do not differentiate. We are supporting manufacturing. We are supporting technology innovating firms. So the EDI doesn't hit us per se, but we, through ALEC, we have other ways of making sure we can support people. And it is about just making sure that everyone has access to the information and support to allow them to go on their own journey. Okay, yes, an important topic. And uh, yeah, watch this space for more activity from certainly from KTN and Made Smarter on that one. Um, so um, we're a bit over time, but I'm very keen that we um, give you time to network. Um, so we'll, I'll hand over to Anita to introduce that section uh, that we'll be closing on until um, the, the scheduled closing time uh, with 11.30. 
So yeah, 15 minutes for open networking and for you to meet interesting collaborative partners. Um, but before I do so, I'll just finish by saying um, we've got a, an, another webinar. It's, um, it's the last one in this series, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, and it is on flexible manufacturing. So we've got the likes of GSK speaking at that. Um, so yeah, do, uh, do register for that and we'll be good to see you again next week.